Like you can breathe now, Chris. He's been running around. I've never seen him move so fast. Good morning. Um, welcome to Beverly Baptist Church. My name's Steph. Um, I'm one of the I'm a member of the leadership team. I'm also the acting centre manager here, but I don't, nobody's new, so you probably all know that. Um, it's really good to see you all. And um, I was just reflecting on the fact that we are part of a centuries-old movement of people uh, and they're all around the world today people are gathering to worship Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as Lord and Saviour in our lives personally but of the world and uh, what a privilege that is to be able to do that um, and to be able to do that with freedom uh, and to be able to do that openly uh, so Thank you, Lord, that we are able to do that. I'm going to... I've, I've actually forgotten my Bible, so can somebody... Joel, would you be so good <laughs> as to find a holy Bible at the back there? I usually use my phone now, so... And I also use a slightly different version, which, uh, which, which, which meant that I became a cropper last time I read from the Bible, so I'm going to try and behave and follow the rules. Thank you. Is that in an IV? <laughs> so, um, I have also the great privilege of being able to welcome somebody who has become, I hope, a friend, uh, but who I got to know when I studied at Theological College a few years ago. And I'll give you a full introduction to Chris Ellis um, a bit later. Um, <laughs> I'm going to big him up so much. <laughs> no pressure at all, Chris. None at all. So, let's get into the word, shall we? If I can find where I'm supposed to be reading. Always prepared me. All right. Let's just still our souls, shall we? Come into the presence of God together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So before anything else, I'm, we're just going to sit with that, sit with those words, and I'm going to hand over to Keith and the, the, and the band to just bring us into the presence of God through some worship. So let's sit with those words for a moment in our hearts and in our minds. In the beginning was the Word. But we know that Word became flesh. Today, around the world, the church is celebrating Advent. We're in the middle of Advent, third Sunday today. Um, our first song... Um, puts into modern words that well-known prayer of Mary's, which in some places we call the Magnificat. Um, let's proclaim the greatness of the Lord with Mary together as we stand and sing, Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's stand.
your seats. Right. Okay. Oh. That's to work, work out where to stand. Apologies. Right, so as Kay said, we're in the season of Advent. Um, now, the word Advent means the arrival of a notable person or thing. That's according to some dictionary or another. I didn't actually make reference to that. So, and it's a really, Advent is a really important time in the Christian calendar. It gives us time to prepare and reflect and remember the birth of Jesus Christ and his arrival on earth. So, the four Sundays before Christmas Day, um, it's, it's traditional in, in lots of church, uh, church traditions to light some Advent calendars. And um, for us at BBC... Candles, sorry, did I say calendars? I'm so glad that you know me, people. <laughs> and that you can translate all that I'm saying. And I just pray, Lord, right now that you enable me to continue to make some form of sense for the rest of the morning. Thank you. All right. So, candles. Um, and for us at BBC... Oh, where do I have to stand? Okay, I will. I'll just leave you to do that. your thing, Chris. All right, so um, at BBC, what we've done, we've focused on different, um, different parts of, of who Jesus is. And I've, got, I've asked Kate, Kate to come and help me. And you're going to come and help me light these candles, aren't you? So Kate, if you come round this way, I'm just trying to think of health and safety and the fact that you've got long hair. <laughs> right, so what I'm going to do is... First of all, we're going to light this candle. I'm going to turn them around. So the first candle, can anybody remember what we were, what kind of part of Jesus' character or, and what some of the significance of who Jesus is? Can you remember on the first Advent Sunday what, the, what we were looking at, what we were talking about? We had a cupboard of darkness. We had a cupboard of darkness, so there's a clue. So what was it that we were looking at? Living in light. Okay, so Katie, can you just, can you make, oh, let's just wait, don't go out, don't go out. Let's just sit, there we are. Can you, no, no, don't, oh, this is not going well for me this morning, is it? That's better. So if you like that one, that is, you've got it? Light. Okay. Right, I'm going to have to do a ca- I'm going to do one at a time because I really don't want to burn any fingers. Your mother won't thank me. Right. So, a second Sunday of Advent. What did we think about? Living in... Don't go out. That was last week, so come on, people. Oh, sorry, you have to shout loud because I'm concentrating here as well. There we are. Hope. And this week, stay there, stay there. And this week, we're looking at, don't worry, living in truth. Thank you, Katie. Well done. Nobody got harmed in the process of that. Well done. Thank you for your help, Katie. So we're going to be looking at um, living in truth. So I was thinking about what that actually means, and um, I was trying to find an illustration that might be a bit helpful. I'm not. I'm, I'm hopefully Chris will expand on that for for the adults. And you never know. Yeah, you never know. I've got hope. I've got faith in you, Chris. So I was thinking about how do we, how do I try and explain this? So bear with me. So back in Genesis, at the beginning of Genesis. It says in the Bible that God created people in his image. So he created a kind of true, a a, a kind of a a measure of what it was like to, to live in truth, to live truly in God's presence and his and his company. But quite quickly, people decided that they wanted to make their own truth and live their own way. And ever since, 
God has been for providing a way, ultimately through Jesus Christ, for us to come back and truly reflect God's image. So I was thinking, oh, how can we illustrate that? And um, in John, John, and and it's through Jesus that we have a we have a true measure. We, it's G- Jesus shows us what living in the truth truly looks like. Because he's the ultimate image of God. He's the ultimate reflection of the Heavenly Father. So I was thinking, how do we illustrate this? How does it, what does it mean when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life, which is what he said in John 14, verse 6. Right, I'm going to, I need to have somebody who, I need somebody's help. And I, um, how tall are you? Well, Katie, I've, you've already been my lovely, very, very helpful assistant. Uh, Alex, Alex, and, um, I, I, I'll use both of you because partly because I'm just loving the jumpers. They're so decorative. So come and display them. So Alex and Jane, do you want to both come up? All right, so just come here. I'm going to move this slightly that way. Right, um, okay, so do you know what this is, gentlemen? It's a stick. A meter stick. A meter stick. Um, it possibly is a meter. If we turn around and have a look. It's a spirit level. Do you know what? I knew you'd know, James. I knew you would know. It's a meter spirit level. Right, James, do you know how this works? Yes. Yeah. Of course you do. I know how it works as well. Right, so spirit levels do what? Can you tell can you tell us? Go on, Alice. Uh they show if it's straight. They show something if it's straight and flat. Yes, flat. So Right at the beginning, can you just hold that a bit? So, James, what I'd like you to, to do is try and make sure it's a straight. So, is that straight? Yes? Yeah, do you think so? What do you agree, Alex? If you're anything like my siblings, then green, agreement might be a bit of a challenge, but you, 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 you two get on with it. Yes, you agree. All right, so, Alex, can you, if James holds that, can you hold it really straight, James? Alex, can you draw a straight line down there for me? Can, I'll hold it at the bottom as well. Go down the easy way, that's it. Oh, this is so complicated. Why don't they do stuff like this? That is it. Does it? Okay. I knew you two were perfect for this job. Precision. Right, hold on there. So if you just stand here for a minute. So here. Right, so, if you stand over here as well, James, because people have got to see the, the, your workmanship. All right. So it's not quite straight because it did slip. But let's go with, go with the illustration. All right. So back in Genesis, we were made in the image of God. All right. This is the image of God. But we've tried to kind of do our own, make our own truth and, and, and do things in our own image in the way that we think. That's what, that's what kind of humankind has got into the habit of doing. However, so I would, I'd like you to just try and draw your own straight line next to that one, please, Alex. No pressure. Marks out of 10. Just, just about here. Kind of right next to it. Now we can try and be good. We can try and follow. <laughs> oh yes, he's not even trying. Oh, no, Alex, you are, you are such, you're such good value. Straight diagonal. Straight Oh look, there we are. But you're you're proving my illustration. You really are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we kind of. You, Human beings sort of lost their track, lost their the truth of what it is to to live with the Creator, to live with God. But then Jesus came along. Can we? Can I? We'll use this spirit level again. All right. So what we need to do is just do it again. All right. And I know that's slightly wonky, but follow that line. Can you, James? Can you just draw that again, right down there? 
Can you just draw it? Oh, I know what we're drawing. Well done, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. You can sit down. You can sit down, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your help. That was brilliant. And Jesus is the ultimate spirit level, isn't he? He kind of, it's through Jesus Christ that we can realign our lives with who God made us to be. And that was classic. Thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate your help there. That wasn't an easy, easy thing to do. Let me go around the other way so I don't make a horrible squeaky noise. <coughs> so, in John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus said to his, some of his followers, if you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I just want us to spend a bit of time all together before the children go out, just sitting with that, with some of those thoughts. I'm just going to ask Keith to come up and just play, because sometimes when we have music that is dedicated to, the, to Jesus, it helps us, it just helps us listen to God and listen to God together. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do that in a minute. Thank you. So Keith is just going to come and pray to us. I've done what I usually do, which is rearrange things, but Keith can work with that. So I would like us to think about a Bible story, a Jesus Bible story. Um, think about something that's memorable in the Bible that Jesus said or did that gave us a measure gave us that bar gave us that hope that we can live freely in a way that he has created us to be and I'd just like us to be, sit and think about that and just say thanks it's very simple just say thank you thank you Jesus that you are our ultimate spirit level Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that through your life and through your death and through your resurrection, everything that you did and everything that you continue to do, that you show us how to live in truth, that you ha show us how to live in the freedom that you've created us to be. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we as we live with you, that we can show what living in the truth is like to other people too. Thank you.
So we're going to go on and have some sung worship in a few minutes. But I just wanted to start with that rather than whiz into, um, into other things because sometimes we don't get a chance to sit with the whole family, as, with all the children as well, and just think about uh, being with God together. Um, we're going to go into sung worship, but there are a few notices. <laughs> And they're all Christmassy, so yay! Um, so uh, on Tuesday, uh, the house group that meets at the Peaches with Emily and Alison's, well, it doesn't always, uh, Emily's going, no, no. Emily and Alison's house group, anyway, and I never know what to call you other than Emily, the Tuesday house group. Okay, because it meets on Tuesday, of course it does. They are having a, um, carols here. And you're all welcome. So if you like singing Christmas carols and you want to join a Tuesday house group and of course have a mince pie, um, please come and join them. What time, Emily? 7.30. 7.30 here, okay? And also on Friday morning in the cafe, when the cafe's open, there are more carols. And if you want to come and join and, and join particularly David and Tracy, they'd really appreciate a few more voices, maybe a music, extra musician or, t- or two, uh, to come and kind of raise the roof a bit while the mayhem, the usual Friday mayhem and madness in the cafe um, continues. But come and, come and join in if you're able. Um, you'd be really welcome. And if you, if you are a musician or a singist, please come and talk to, to Tracy or David after the service. Um, at 10.30 to 11.30. That's right, is it? Yes, 10.30 to 11.30. Thank you, Peter. Um, and on the, uh, the 24th, which is indeed Christmas Eve next Sunday, yes, so many, not many more sleeves, not many, not many more sleeves, um, there's going to be a children's Christmas party during the service as well, okay? So, did you want to ask me something there, Kate, or were you just going, yay, yay, yay? <laughs> And don't forget, um, even last minute, um, people are really welcome to come and uh, join us for our first ever Christmas dinner after our Christmas service um, on next Monday, on Christmas Day. Um, you'll ver- just come and um, be with us. There's about 30 of us, but if, le- if you still want, if you still haven't put your name down and have kind of go, oh, actually, I would like to come and join everyone else, you're very welcome. Um, I'm looking at David and Stephen's faces and going, no, (laughs) they're the ones who are doing the cooking. Um, So please, uh, that's going to be straight after the service. We're going to try and eat by one and maybe finish by um, sort of round up around about 3.30, 4 o'clock, okay? Um, The final notice is that we have hoodies. I don't, is anybody wearing a BBC hoodie today? Chris, come model, come model. Come. <laughs> All right, so now just give us a bit of a turn. Just. <laughs> That's the slowest I've seen him move today. Um, so if you would like to purchase a hoodie or a t-shirt, please see Karen. She will tell you costings and things like that. So if you want to, if you want some of the kit, some of the BBC merch, as it is. Please go see Karen. Right, also one of the things we like to do is to celebrate. And um, we celebrate birthdays, anniversaries, important happenings in, in, in the lives of people who come on the, our church community. Has anybody ha- had a birthday, anniversary? <gasps> oh, look, a convertible pleasure of a birthday. Where do I, I, I'm going to... Is it your birthday today? A wedding anniversary. You're allowed to take two then. You're going to have one. Eddie's going to have one. There we are, Sean. Have a crunchy or a Twix or whatever they are. Twirl. Then you can fight over which one. Okay. I have a birthday next week. Right, yes. Yes, so you're, that's entitled you technically. I'm not one of these birthday babies. Take your time, Alex. We've got all day. <laughs> 
we don't actually have all day, so just, just choose. Otherwise, we're going to get your brother to choose for you. I'm going to get. Uh, I'm, you've got two seconds of one. Two closes. Oh, Hilda. Where's the anniversary? Sir? Well. Yes, yours is not surprisingly. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it, sir. <laughs> Lucy! My daughter passed the like the nursing board exam. I think she's... And my son passed the... Well, you... Then you can... I you can take that job. Good, good, good. So, that's... Um, and... Oh, Julie. Julie. Julie's birthday today! Happy birthday! Quick! We're running out! Ah, and Emma's got a new job. That's definitely also yeah. worth a picture. So, um, for those who repellish the uh, crunchy tin, we might need we might need it, it. It's gone considerably lower. That's fabulous. So let's just pray before we hand over. Oh, somebody else. Oh yeah. Okay. So Peter said. Peter said. Um, Peter said. Uh, Chris ought to have one, but but, but he honestly did organise. Uh, a brilliant Kaylee last night, and uh, um, so thank you, Chris. And actually, you probably need a few more calories after all the running around this morning. <laughs> okay. Right. So, thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate. Thank you for birthdays. Wedding anniversaries, great life achievements, new jobs. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to after the we're going to have a time of song worship now. After the first song, the children are, are going to go out to their activities. Uh, let me just pray for them now and for the people who are teaching them and looking after them. Lord, we thank you that we have a multi-generational church family here at Beverly Baptist Church. Thank you for our children and young people. We're really grateful for them, for all that they give to us, all the joy and the noise and the fun. We thank you for them. Uh, pray, Lord Jesus, that you... You show them more of who you are uh, as they go out to their activities. May they have fun and may they know you more. Amen. So the children go out after the first song. I'm handing over to Keith and Thank, Thank you. Now, I, I love the season of Advent. I love the season of Advent. It means lots of things as we go through. We think about different things. One of the things I love is the, sort of, the mystery of the idea about Almighty God, that he could and that he would and that he did confine himself to become a member of the human race, to confine himself to become a baby. And that's, uh, oh, what a mystery, as Graham Kendrick wrote in one of his songs. What a mystery, what a mystery. Now, one day, the whole world is going to whether they like it or not, they're going to bow their knees at that, in front of that baby king, whether they like it or not. I was, our next song, Come Now Is The Time To Worship, recognises the fact that today it's our choice and we do choose as we come with our open hearts before and that we come to bow before him. Not because we must, like maybe in some future time people might have to. Not because we must, but because we may. Because we may. So, come. Now is the time to worship. Let's stand.
children leave us now. about different themes during Advent. Um, the ideas of waiting are with us in Advent. The ideas of light and darkness are with us. And uh, just to bring, the, bring us back to reality a bit, uh, when we look at the, what's happening in the world today around us, I wonder, in all this where are you, Lord? In this darkness that we see, where are you, Lord? When will your light break into this darkness? <coughs> so we're going to sing, and probably along with a lot of people, the feeling of a lot of people in the world these days, uh, longing for light, we wait in darkness. sing together long in for light.
come. What more can we pray as we see the scenes of destruction and killing of thousands of innocent children and women and men? Our hearts break when we watch our TVs. Does your heart break too? Ukraine and Russia, Gaza, West Bank, Israel are all in our headlines and there's so many more such places. We want this war making to end for you. Nobody here seems to have the power to make it happen. Like King Jehoshaphat, we turn to you and say, Lord, we don't know what to do. So our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do. Our eyes are on you. Christ be our light. Shine in our heart. Shine through the darkness. Shine through your church today. Amen. Uh, before Tom comes to, to read um, read the scripture to us and I introduce Chris, I'd just like to oh, <laughs> very dramatic. I'd just like to kind of respond to what Keith is saying as well because at the beginning of the of, of our time together I, I, I just said it was re- it's really great that we can meet together in, in freedom. And there are so many brothers and sisters in Christ around the world at this moment in time who do not have that privilege to be able to do that. And I'd like to just take a few moments where we can pray um, openly and think about different places in the world where it is not easy um, and in some cases it's life-threatening to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And particularly at this time of Advent when we have the freedom to remember all that Christ did for us. Let's let's just spend a few minutes um, thinking about our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who don't have that freedom and pray that the Lord strengthen them. So just going to have a few minutes of open worship. Spirit, come and inspire us, Lord. Remind us of those loved ones around the world who profess the name of Jesus Christ, who bow the knee and say that you are Lord and Saviour who do not have the freedoms that we have. Lord, bring to mind people in nations of the world who need to know your comfort and strength in times of difficulty, persecution. So if we would would, um, people pray out for um, places in the world that come to mind as we sit and pray? Iran. Iran. Palestine. So yeah, the the, the Christians in Palestine. North Korea. North Korea. Albania. Albania. Yemen. Yemen. China. China. Sudan. Sudan. Iraq. Iraq. Pakistan, Nigeria, Nigeria. Bangladesh, Bangladesh. Eritrea, Russia, Russia. Somalia, Somalia, Somalia. Somalia. or Somalia, Somalia. Somalia. For countries that, yeah, where there are, yeah. <coughs> Lord, how quickly we bring to mind so many countries, so many nations in this world where people do not have the freedom to profess the name of Jesus Christ openly. Lord, will you strengthen and comfort our brothers and sisters? May they be a light. May they show what it is to live in the truth in the difficulties of the circumstances they find themselves in. Strengthen and bless them in this time. Amen.
Tom, would you just come and read today's scripture for us, please? First reading is taken from Second Peter chapter one, verses five through nine. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self control, and to self control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is short-sighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Thank you, Tom. I have a great pleasure to introducing Chris Ellis to you. <clears throat> he was my tutor, as I, as I said, one of my tutors at Theological College. He's also my spiritual director. <laughs> um, but if, for those people who've been in Baptist services where um, we've used a, 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 a liturgical text um, for baptisms, weddings, funerals, funerals uh, ministerial inductions, those texts were written by Chris, no pressure for me up here right today. So um, Chris has got, uh, he's also, you were also president of the Baptist Union one year as well, weren't you? So his halo is very shiny. <laughs> so Chris, come up and join us, please. Let's pray. Chris has been such an inspiration to me. It's been such a privilege to have him in my life. And um, he's one of those constants that keeps me on the straight and narrow you'd be so be grateful <laughs> so i just i personally am very grateful for this man for his wisdom for his deep uh, intellect for his joy of living uh, for his creativity and i pray that you bless his words today and that those words will have deep resonance in our hearts and minds and be transformative. So Holy Spirit rest on you, Chris, as you come to us. Amen. <clears throat> After a good sing and before preaching, I need a glass of water. Well, it's great to be here. I have to say that I'm grateful to the invitation. But there was an invitation a while back. I can't remember whether it was snow or COVID that stopped it. It was COVID, yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was due to come and be with you. <clears throat> My voice isn't what it was, partly post-COVID, <laughs> um, which I had very mildly, but uh, somehow it left a wobble. So I might need more water before we're through. Um, but it's good to be here for two reasons. Firstly, because um, whether I have to duck after saying this, this is the first time I've ever been to Beverly. Yeah, not really. Yeah. Um, aye, indeed. <laughs> yeah. And, and secondly, um, often, especially when you're um, an older minister and you still go and you preach in various places, you do have things in your back pocket called sermons. Um, but I have to say that I particularly like it when people are following a theme and they say, we want you to preach on this, right? And I think the second thing is, I'm not sure I've ever preached on 2 Peter before. So that's an admon admonition to me about that, because there's some, some pure gold there that I, you know, yeah, really good. Um, but let's pause for a moment, and I'll just leave this in a brief prayer. <laughs> May, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, God our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Um, now, I gather that you have been following, in terms of Sunday themes, 
um, the Bible in a year. Now, I, I assume you didn't do all the readings necessary to have read all the Bible in Sunday worship in the course of a year, <laughs> but you've been following the themes of Bible in a year. And those themes are followed on in Advent, and this week the theme is, as we've been told, living in truth. And it's this theme of living in truth that I'm wanting to reflect on this morning with the passages you gave me and one or two others as well. The readings, and especially if we'd gone on a bit further, I thought the reading was going to go on a bit later in the chapter, but um, it's very clear from what the writer is saying that um, he is challenging what he sees to be error in the churches that he's writing to. In other words, he's trying to put them straight. This is nothing new. You find it in Paul's letters as well. The letters are pastoral letters written because there are problems. If we think that the early church was a golden age, all you've got to do is read the New Testament because most of the letters in the New Testament were written because there was trouble at mill in the churches that had been newly founded. And that's true in terms of this second letter of Peter. So when we talk about living in truth and we put alongside it um, passages like this, we realise that actually living in truth isn't straightforward. It isn't easy either to keep to the truth or necessarily to agree on what is the truth. And that's certainly the case in the letters that we can read in the New Testament where often the writer is saying, you're doing this or you're saying this, but this is what we believe. This is the truth. And the world in which we live is a world in which the truth is contested. We have these days something that is rather sinisterly called fake news. Fake news, where social media puts around certain assertions which claim to be true. And whereas in the old days you thought, depending on whatever your newspaper of choice was, you could believe what you read in the newspaper some of the time. Now we are never sure what to believe. And I found this particularly shocking when I was visiting our daughter and family a year ago in uh, South Carolina, where our grandkids have been influenced by the culture of what I would call Trump world, to say, well, you can't believe what you read in the BBC, here on the BBC. Why would you believe the BBC? They're as biased as anyone else. So what is real, what is true, is a real problem for us today. To the point where in the last few years there have been real challenges about the way in which foreign governments have sponsored the skewing of social media to affect elections in democratic countries. What is true? Uh, it reminds me of the story of the public speaker and I'm not sure whether it was supposed to be a minister or a politician depending on who's telling the story I suppose. But on the the speaker's notes in the margin at one point, he had written, argument weak, shout louder. <laughs> huh? We live in a culture that people describe as postmodern. And part of what that label postmodern seems to imply is that what matters is not what is true, but what you believe to be true. Your truth, my truth, we all have different truths. It's supposed to be what a postmodern world is about. And in this, what we might call, world that is so relative and so moving and difficult to get a handle on, one danger for Christians is to fall back on assertion, shout louder. And perhaps sometimes, well, quite often, to read and to misuse the Bible as a part of our reaction to the slipperiness of the so-called truths around us. And so we sometimes, I think, mis misread the Bible because we mistake what the Bible is and is saying to us. The way I describe this is, now, 
Um, if you've got, um, if you do music streaming and you have collections, one of the ways that you can choose your music and organize your music, I like my music very organized, is to have genre. Yes? The trouble with Apple is that everything that I choose is classical, which means I have thousands in there. And I don't really want West Coast jazz necessarily, or warehouse something or other, which obviously is a lot more popular than classical because everything gets bundled into classical. But genres, different styles, different cultures, different ways of making music. And the same is true in the things that we read and write. There are different genres. Not just in terms of whether you read novels and whether it's detective stories or whether it's romances or whether it's non-fiction or whatever, those sort of genres, but the different kinds of writing that we read. So, for example, I wouldn't read a novel in the same way as I read the telephone directory. Right? I wouldn't read a book of poetry in the same way as I read a science textbook. The kind of writing it is affects the way that I read it. Are you with me? Yeah. And as I think about the Bible, the place where we come for truth, I recognize the scriptures have much to say about the earth and the universe, but the Bible isn't primarily a science textbook. The scriptures contain many laws, but it's not primarily a law book. The scriptures contain a lot of historical writing, but it is far more than a history book. The scriptures contain a huge amount of theology, but it isn't a systematic book of theology. The scripture contains much guidance for living, but it's not a self-help book or a self-improvement program. We need to read aware of what kind of writing we are reading, because that's how God speaks to us. Because, of course, Scripture is a library of books with varying different emphases, and in doing Bible through the year, you'll have got something of that, with a different genre that you'll have had, the history and the law and the, story, the parables and the prophecies and so on. The way that I would describe it is that I believe that the Bible is a book of testimony, or is a collection of of books of testimony, testifying to the actions and the word of God. We affirm the Bible as the word of God and as the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, my hand up to that. But then when I think of this as someone who thinks and sometimes teaches and writes theology, I ask myself, what does it mean to talk about the Bible as the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, the original actions of God, which we read about in the Bible, were the work of the Holy Spirit. God working and moving, even from creation onwards, the work of the Spirit. The writers are inspired by the Holy Spirit to testify to those actions of God and those words of God, the work of the Holy Spirit. And then after the... Uh, the time of Jesus and the formation of the church, the church was inspired over time by the Holy Spirit to recognize these writings as Holy Scripture, the Word of God. So the Spirit, after the writings, helps us recognize these as God's Word. And then God continues to speak to us as we read Scripture today. The Holy Spirit continues to inspire as we read and as we wrestle and struggle to understand. But the reality is that when we read the Bible, we can, you and I can come to different conclusions. How is it that we come to read scripture and how is it that we make sense of it? And how do we sift and filter and read the different types of writing that make up scripture? How do we apply them to different life situations and experiences? And so I ask myself, is there somehow a clue or a key or better still, is there a lens through which I can look like a pair of spectacles? 
Is there a lens that I can look through to help me read and to guide and be nourished by Scripture, to help me to understand and to read aright these words that are on the page? Because on the page, they're just words on the page. They become alive when the Spirit inspires me to read and helps me to understand. So what lens? And the answer is very simple. It's a one-word answer. The lens is Jesus. The lens is Jesus. The first verse of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word. And then in verse 14, one of my favourite verses in the whole of the Bible, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, such glory as if it's the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth, truth. There's so much in that verse, and that would be a series of sermons, and I can't do that today, but I do need to pick out two or three things from John 1.14. The first is this word, word. In the beginning was the word. Um, the Greek word is logos, from which you get words like logical. Logos. My Bible software is called logos. The word. That which God speaks to the world. That which is true because it comes from God. The word. That which runs through the whole of the universe, that which gives light and reasoning and sustains and holds everything together. That's also in the verses between verse 1 and verse 14. This sense of everything held together, that which is true of God, becomes flesh. The Word became flesh. Um, There's a, a Scottish poet called Edwin Muir, writing in the middle of the 20th century, And I'm paraphrasing one of his poems, um, because I can't remember the actual words. But the message is is, is so on the ball. The word became flesh, and we've been trying to reverse the process ever since. Yeah? We turn it back into words, into theories. Uh, Some people might talk about the two sides of your brain, you know, left brain and right brain, the creative and the analytical. There's something very creative about the word becoming flesh, embodied in a human life. The word, the truth about God, God himself. The other thing, and this is something that only came to me in study recently, in the, in the last, um, well, in this autumn, really, I've been reading various things around this theme. And that is that the, the Greek word that, that is used to talk about dwell or live amongst us is better translated camp. Because the word that's used is the word that in the Greek version of the Old Testament is the word that translates the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And so you have this this connection between this verse, the word becoming flesh, and that picture of God's presence and glory in the tabernacle as the Hebrew slaves trudge through the desert. The sense of God's presence, but a mobile presence, always with them, wherever they go. Um, Eugene Peterson in the message says um, God moved into the neighbourhood, his translation for that bit. That's okay, but I don't think it does it. Because this tabernacling, this, the, the best translation I've heard is the word became flesh and pitched his tent amongst us and we saw his glory. The glory of the Shekinah over the tabernacle, right? So what's being said here is that the word, this eternal truth about God, takes bodily form in Jesus, and we see the glory of God in this Jesus, full of grace and truth. And today we're living in truth. Now, I'd want to say, as someone who tries to do theology, that... God is beyond anything that I can understand. I'm the creature here, right? I'm probably not a very good one, but I'm the creature. How can the creature comprehend the maker? 
So there's a sense in which whenever I try and say something theological, whenever I preach, whenever I try and write something, I'm always pointing in the direction. I'm not actually doing the, the big deal because that's beyond anything I can say, anything I can understand, certainly anything you can understand from what I've said. <laughs> it's just beyond us. It's more. And so what does it mean then to talk about truth in relation to God? And I have to come back and say that the truth is person-shaped. The word became flesh. So the closest we can get to God, and not in any kind of theological statements, the closest we can get to God is Jesus. Because he tabernacled amongst us and we saw his glory. This, in 2 Peter, becomes clear because, um, of course, one of the themes of Advent is the connection between the first coming of Jesus in Bethlehem and the second coming of Jesus at the end of time, the Advent hope. And um, uh, 2 Peter is talking about that, and he says, we know that when he comes, he will be glorious. And we know that because we've already on the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration, seen something of his glory. We are eyewitnesses. We're back to testimony again. We are eyewitnesses to his glory. But the trouble with the church that 2 Peter is addressing, and which we also find elsewhere in the New Testament, is a problem to do with certain views about how we understand what it is to be a human being, how we understand the universe, and within that, how we try and fit God into a preconceived idea of what we mean by these things. And there were two things that were going wrong in the churches that 2 Peter was writing, that was addressed to. The first was an, uh, an understanding of the material world and what it meant to be a human being that was somehow flawed because it didn't see human beings as being in the image of God to go back to, to what Steph was saying earlier in the service, but that somehow the material world was spoilt and evil and that human beings were not possible of any kind of perfection. Therefore, it wasn't possible for, well, there were two things. One was, therefore, we ignore it, and we spend our time trying to be spiritual. We don't deal with the nuts and bolts bits of life. We don't deal with behavior. We don't deal with how we treat other people. We just deal with being spiritual. Inverted commas, as my granddaughter would put it. Air quotes. Spiritual as though spiritual was separate from how I treat my neighbour or my wife or my child or somebody who disagrees with me at work or whatever, as though somehow there's a disconnect between those two. So on the one hand, there was this, this view that um, all we had to do was be spiritual and we could ignore ethical guidelines, we could re ignore relationships. And the second was, and it was linked to it, which was that God never really became a human being just looked like one. Right? And, and this is where he says, but we've seen it. We, we, this is the person that we followed. This is the person that we've, we've staked our lives on. Truth. We begin and end with Jesus. I, I was fascinated by these verses in that first, those, that first chapter of, of 2 Peter. And it reminds me of bits in Paul, like the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? And other passages like that, where you get a list. But here the list is built up as a kind of argument, one leading to the next. You must make every effort to support your faith, spiritual bit, with goodness, how you behave and treat one another. And goodness with knowledge, truth, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with mutual affection. I mean, I think of our ministry, how many times have I met, have I met people that fit the bill that I once heard described, that they, 
they wear a barbed wire halo. At one level, very spiritual, but very spiky at the same time. As though somehow there's a disconnect. So godliness leads to mutual affection with love. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But as I read that list, and as I read the sort of parallel things in Paul's letters, these lists of the fruit of the Spirit, or this list here about characteristics of being a Christian, what comes through is that they are a portrait of Jesus. I recognise them as what I see in him. So I want to suggest to you that in order for us to to read and to understand and to apply truth as we read scripture. We need to read scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ. The technical term would be we have a Christ-centered hermeneutic. The way we interpret scripture is always from the perspective of Jesus Christ. So when we hit what seems to be a contradiction, as we read the Bible, we return to Jesus. When we don't understand an obscure verse, we start with Jesus and work from there. When we disagree with one another about how to interpret something, we both go back to Jesus. The rule, the thing that keeps us centred, the thing that keeps us I wouldn't say the straight and narrow, but I'm not sure. Yeah, the straight and narrow. But more particularly, close to him. One of the suggested readings was from uh, the first letter of John, the first few verses of chapter 4. And in that passage, um, we're encouraged to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. So when somebody somebody comes and says, I believe God is saying this or that, or I believe that this is what this passage means, that actually we are encouraged to test it. Don't simply take it at face value, but test it. And the key to testing in that passage in 1 John 4 is the confession that Jesus came from God and was truly human that he came in the flesh. This is the key, the clue to making sense of everything. In our lives, in the Bible, in our fears and hopes, continually back to Jesus. And after those verses, with uh, I'm conscious that I, I'll try not to do it too much, but inevitably I'm going to look forward to what you're doing next week. Because it seems to me that uh, you can't just read a few verses of anything. You also have to ask what happens next. Right? And those verses where John says about testing the spirit, he immediately goes on and says this in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. So when we're asking about truth, we can't have truth apart from love. Because the lens through which we see the truth is Jesus. For love comes from God, he writes. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, Here's the application. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. We're back to truth now. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, wow, As I said, I don't want to steal thunder from next week. But we need to read and hear and know this. That if you like to come back to something I said at the beginning, 
truth is personal. Not primarily in the postmodern sense that you can have your truth and I'll have my truth. And it is personal in the sense that every truth has to be something that I have to own and accept. It's no good just having truth out there. It has to be something that I can affirm, something that grabs me, something that I can be convicted about. Truth. There's a sense in which truth is personal when I t can take hold of it or be held by it in that kind of way. But truth is personal in a far more important way. Truth is personal because truth is to be found in Jesus Christ who said I am the way the truth and the life and truth is personal in Christ because we have a personal God a God who primarily does not come to us in statements and logical arguments but comes to us as a father embracing his children who comes to us as the father waiting for the son to return from a far country who comes to us as the shepherd in search of the sheep that's lost on the mountainside a personal God in search of his children I reflected that um, Paul didn't write, I know what I have believed. He wrote, I know whom I have believed. See the difference? That faith isn't primarily a signing up to a set of assertions, however true. Faith is primarily trusting in a personal God and trusting in the God who comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation, the word made flesh, like a dog, isn't just for Christmas. The incarnation is for all the year. It all holds together. It all holds together. That all that God does and all that God promises and all God offers in Scripture and all God offers through the, the faithful prayers and love of fellow believers, all that God offers is focused in the person of Jesus Christ. So we can, with the front row, go, yeah, about a Christmas party. But all year we need to celebrate. In Advent we can sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, but all year we need to affirm that Emmanuel means God with us. In all things, in all circumstances, in places of tears and places of laughter. God with us, the personal God. In Jesus, but also in our lives. Scripture testifies to Jesus, and we need to testify to him as well. So yes, it is vitally important that we search the Scriptures, that we study the Scriptures, that we seek to live in the truth. But we know deep down that the scriptures point us towards the one who is truth, the personal God made, embodied in Jesus. And there is the deepest truth. And the implication of that for Christian living is that the word became flesh in first century Bethlehem. The word seeks to become flesh in our lives. The word needs to be made flesh in our daily living. The disconnects need to be put away and we need to be spiritual in how we treat one another. We need to be spiritual in how we testify to Jesus. Living in the truth. Let's pray. Loving God, we, we celebrate that you are a great big God, bigger than anything that we can grapple with our minds, worthy of our worship. 
But at the same time, your greatness is a greatness that comes to us in humility. Your power is a power that comes to us in love. You are a God who seeks a relationship with persons. And you come to us in love, in forgiveness, in grace. And we see all this in Jesus. We want to live in the truth. And by that we mean we want to live close to Jesus. To become more and more in his likeness. We ask for the work of your Holy Spirit to shape and transform us that our lives as well as our words might point others to Jesus. That your love might not be just be something that we read in scripture but that your love might be embodied in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Living in light, living in hope, living in truth, next week living in love. Let's aspire to let the Spirit of Jesus enable us to do that. Let's use the words of this next song. Tune, new words, the tune will know though very well. Let love be real. Let love be real. Let's stand to sing.
Thank you. Please be seated. Let me just read a closing prayer, which um, uh, is from Lectio 365. For those of you who use that um, prayer app, let's just close and say, may this day bring Sabbath rest to our hearts and our homes. May our peace and perspective be renewed in the busyness of this season. May our hands be free enough from spending and acquiring to receive your gift. May a little of the wonder and magic of Christmas awaken the child in, within us today. And may God's word feed us and his spirit lead us into this week and into the life to come. Amen. Please stay for tea and coffee. And can I just first apologise before we do that, because the other people to thank about for, for, uh, for such a success of last night were also uh, Ruth and Stephen, who did such a brilliant job of feeding us as well. And apologies to you two for not thanking you at the time. Uh, you can come and get a crunchy. <laughs> Um, and you can go and say thank you personally if you were there today to Ruth because she's going to serve us tea and coffee um, and thank you also to Chris for coming and speaking to us uh, so please um, enjoy each other's company stay, have a hot beverage or a cold one and uh, yeah, have a good day the rest of your day God bless you, alright <laughs>